Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to DocFest 2021 edition. It's great to be here. Um, as we're doing this virtually this year, I guess we can imagine, we can use our imagination as to where it would be in Sheffield right now if we were doing this in 3D. In my head, we are main stage crucible theatre, um, but the reality is I think Bijal Patel, the brilliant producer of this session, has probably booked us in a side room in a pub somewhere quite a way out of town. Either way, it's all good. Uh, the title of this session is Making My First Film, and our five panellists um, who have all had that directing breakthrough on the BBC um, new uh, director scheme are going to walk us through the chronology of that first film from the initial idea through to broadcast and beyond. Um, I'm really hoping that it's going to be a practical session with tips along the way so you guys can learn from our panel's success, but also the stuff that didn't quite go to plan. Um, I think there'll be an opportunity to ask questions, which I'll try to pick up as we go. In fact, there's going to be a couple of moments where we're going to stop for questions. I've never chaired a panel before on Zoom or in the real world, for that matter, so you might have to bear with me a little. Um, so that's the plan. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to the panel, the, the majority of which have made their first films in the last 18 months. So the experience is still relatively fresh in their minds, experience that hopefully you guys can learn from. Um, as well as being first time filmmakers, the people sat on the panel today, I have no doubt will go on to shape what we'll be watching on TV for years to come. Some will be award winning filmmakers, some will become commissioning editors, channel controllers or owners of independent production companies. One day we'll probably all be working for them. So with that in mind, it's probably a good idea for us to get to know them. Um, first up, it's Angela Byrne. Angela directed um, the Zara McDermott revenge porn film. Um, it was a film that really resonated with uh, young audiences on iPlayer, a brave film on the devastating impacts of re revenge porn and the online issues affecting young women. It has had over 1.2 million iPlayer requests with a large 16 to 34 year old um, um, audience profile. Uh, next up it's Ziad Desai. Ziad, uh, Ziad's first film, Bad Influencer, is about Belle Gibson an Australian wellness influencer who lied about healing her own cancer with a clean eating diet. Through her story, Ziad explores complicated, our complicated relationship with social media. Recently, he directed a film for the forthcoming new BBC One religion series, and he also worked on the legendary BBC Three series, Valley Cops, Ambulance, and Mance and the Lost Tapes. He made his first film also via the BBC Directors Initiative. Um, then we have Neve Kennedy. Neve's film, Abused by My Girlfriend, is a groundbreaking film um, which broke the taboo about female on male uh, domestic violence. It was nominated for a broadcast award. It's had over one million requests within the first eight days of being published in live player, and it's had two million today. Um, since that film, uh, she's made a film about Joey Essex. Um, I think that's, that went out very recently, didn't it, Neve? Yeah, last Thursday. Last Thursday, and um, and she also uh, has made a doc about the Corby poisoning for BBC Two, and is now directing uh, the lorry deaths also for BBC Two. Um, then we have Tash Gaunt. Uh, she produced and directed Race Pop and Power, fronted by Leanne Pinnock uh, for BBC Three. A very timely subject matter, and there's an interesting story about how it all came about, which we're going to dig into uh, in this session. Um, previously, Tash has worked on um, BBC productions such as the multi-award winning Ambulance. And last, not but, last, last but not least, we have Marion Mohammed. And Marion's film, Defending Digger D, is about a rising British drill rap star, Digger D, as he's released from prison and his subsequent challenges with the law. She's now a director on a series about Robert Maxwell for BBC Two. Previously, Marion produced documentaries that included uh, the Channel 4 prison series, BBC One's Life and Birth, um, and she also made her film on the New Directors Initiative. And, uh, and Marion, I believe you won some kind of um, prize or something <laughs> recently. <didn't you? laughs> yeah, just a, just a little BAFTA, something called a BAFTA, yeah. which um, was amazing. <laughs> yeah, a little BAFTA. Round of applause for Marion. So. <laughs> That's our, amazing, um, that's our amazing panel and I'm really looking forward to talking to you over the next um, 50 minutes trying to get an understanding of um, your films and how they came about and, and, and your successes and challenges. Um, before, we, uh, before we do that, um, I believe we've got a show reel 
that gives a taste of what these filmmakers are capable of. Um, so maybe you could run that, please, Adam. Wow, so that's powerful stuff in um, what has been a really eventful 18 months um, that none of us are going to forget. Um, when it comes to timing, Tash, your film with Leanne Pinnock was right on there, right on top of the story. Um, can you explain a bit about how it came about, whose idea it was to make the film? Sure. So um, Leanne and I actually went to secondary school together and we've been really close friends ever since. And it was a few years ago that she started opening up to me for the first time about uh, how she'd been feeling in the band and um, her lots of other experiences that happened in her life. And kind of, she was like thinking more about race and how it had impacted her and she like we were at a dinner uh one night i mean it was years ago like 2019 and um she just kind of started asking me like do you think we could make a documentary about this and she wanted to explore how she was feeling and you know use her experience explore what she was feeling with other people who had similar experiences and also different ones to her and figure out what she could you do to use this kind of massive platform she now has as a member of little mix in um, to fight the racism that she sees in the world around her. So I um, took the kind of baby fledgling idea to uh, Dragonfly because they were a company that I'd worked with um, over the years quite a bit. And uh, together we kind of developed the uh, treatment and worked on a pitch and then um, I took the idea to Max um, on the uh commissioning team at the BBC to um, see if it was something that they'd be interested in doing. And it kind of went from there, really. When um, when you're making your first film, I suppose having sort of personal access or access to stories that you know is often quite a, a good shortcut, isn't it, to getting something commissioned? But was there ever, did you ever feel that there was a risk there because of your friendship um, with Leanne? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I definitely came to understand that, that like, you know, an idea is great, but without the access, it's just an idea. And I hadn't uh, directed a single film before. Um, so you know, I was like, well, why would I necessarily be trusted with this one? But uh, yeah, I definitely, I will never make another film quite like this. Like, you know, Leanne had said, she was like, I really want to make this, but I'm only going to do it if you do it with me because I trust you. And it, it is a huge asset, obviously, having um you know a long time to build up uh trust with a contributor kind of before you even start filming but it does add a level of anxiety i was probably naively didn't quite anticipate before we stepped into it because there's definitely lots of sleepless nights where i was just thinking oh oh my god what if uh you know she hates the film and impacts our friendship um but yeah you know we had 17 years to kind of build up a relationship before we started filming uh but it was navigating that new the new way that our relationship worked and something that um it was all about communication really we just on the first day of filming uh I kind of sat down and I was like look we're always we're going to be friends I've got two hats on here uh my friendship hat is always going to be on in the background but when I've got this camera I am director first and sometimes you might not like me very much um, and sometimes I might take you to a bit of a dark place but it's all to make the best possible film so it's, I think it was all about communicating that and communication early on that kind of set the groundwork for how the relationship would work through making the film. Brilliant. Um, Marion how long did you know um, Digger D before you started making your film with him? Um, I met Digger the first time I was filming the film, first day of filming really, he was being released from prison. So I basically met him at the prison <laughs> gates, which was daunting because obviously documentaries, you know, you kind of, even if you don't know them very well, you know, you sort of try to spend some time with them, try to sort of explain what you're doing. And so basically I was kind of really nervous of trying to get that shot. Obviously it was a very shaky shot in the end, <laughs> but, um, but also kind of, you know, filming, capturing the moment and then kind of backtracking and, you know, then getting to know him properly. Um, so yeah. That was an experience. And, and without that sort of 15 years of friendship, um, how do you build uh, trust in what I suppose is quite a short period of time? Um, I think 
I mean, I sort of really had to sort of be very open and honest with them. And I think sometimes what, you know, a mistake that can be made, especially when we're filming with young people, he's 19, you sort of, so you maybe assume that you can tell them what to do or, you know, so it was a one way shoot and actually look, this is what I would like to do. What do you do? It's a sort of very open conversation about the kind of film that I was hoping to make, um, but also how he felt about that and, you know, how comfortable he was with that. Um, and I was quite lucky before he got released from prison. I also sort of made sure that I got to know, you know, his friends, his management. I stayed in touch with his mum. So it sort of already felt like I had sort of built some relationships around him and he could kind of trust me mm -hmm. coming out, you know, out of mm -hmm. prison. Mm -hmm. And, and um, in terms of, I mean, Tash, you brought the idea to the BBC, whereas Mariam, I think with your film, you were teamed up with the idea in the production company. But how did you, how did you then sort of, shape that to become the film that you wanted it to be? What was the process from when you were given the sort of, you know, the, the, the access or the start of the access? How did you then, you know, make it a, a Marian film? Um, I, I mean, I really enjoyed hanging out. I loved the world. I loved interacting with them. So there's a lot of, so I felt like I'm, um, it was sort of me going into that world. So, you know, our, the film is sort of very conversational. When I interview him, you can hear my voice. Um, I was very, I knew that I needed to film in certain ways. Like I, I wanted to sit them all down for interviews. Um, but I think more it's my presence. I think that's what kind of made it my own in a way. Um, and, and yeah, just, just having sort of fun with, you know, mobile phone footage and, but yeah, basically my voice all over it. <laughs> It, it, it was brilliant. And then, and Neve, so was your film. I mean, it was a real sort of, as I said in the intro, a real groundbreaking film. What was the moment when you knew that it had moved from what was an idea into a commission? Was there a sort of critical moment that you can identify that you knew it was going to sort of get commissioned and, and, and then the sort of production started? Um, well, I think it was when we we had to, myself and Avi, who was the head of development at Century at the time, she had come across the idea and said to me, Neve, I'm chasing this and we had to go to the police were managing the access with Alex so we had to go to the police station and meet the police press officer and Alex together um, and there was about nine production companies I think fighting for the idea at the same time because there, it had gotten a lot of press at the time and everybody had wanted it um, and I I had a strong feeling Avi was going to go on her own and I said to her can I go with you and meet Alex because I had a feeling if I could just get in front of him and sit down face to face with him and say I'm the director and this is how I would make the film um, that it, it could really help. And um, Avi had a really clever idea um, of, you know, in order just to give Alex a feeling of agency in the whole process of pitching two ideas to him, two ways of making the film, um, you know, and went in. So we went in with a really definite idea of what we wanted to do. And we said, OK, we can either do it this way or we can do it this way. And, you know, how would you you know how would you respond to each of these proposals and after we walked out the door i felt really strong about it because i felt like there was a connection made with alex and he after they decided to go with us he said to me you know there was a few production companies you know coming saying oh well how would you like to make the film and you know and, and he said it was it just all felt a bit wishy-washy and he said you know i just really liked the fact that um you know i could see the film, you know, and, I, and I, I had a bit of choice, but I could see what you wanted to do and what you guys were gonna do. And, you know, I have to give credit to Avi for that, for <laughs> being really smart, um, you know, in doing that. And then from that point onwards, I think it was just about building the relationship with Alex and getting to know him. And I think Marion mentioned honesty, and I think that was a really big thing as well, you know, just, being really, really honest with him at the get-go and having an open dialogue, because I think with somebody who has been abused, they've been subservient to somebody for quite a long time. And you have to be really mindful of that. And, you know, and mindful of you having then control over their story and, you know, helping them feel like they have control over telling it and giving them, making them feel empowered enough to be able to tell it. Um, and then breaking down because he had told the story to the press so many times. I think he had like a specific way he went, thought the story should be told and just throwing all that out the window as well was a key thing. And um, and, and so the, and 
so, I mean, to get to get that kind of access with that sort of competition is is, is really impressive. So, so it's it's more about sort of honesty, but giving them a clear idea of what is going to be, you know, what is your vision for the film, so they can sort of buy into that. Um, was yeah. that Angela? What was what was it like for you when you were sort of pitching your doc? Was that a, a similar sort of process? I actually wasn't involved in the pitching process at all. So I already knew summer films quite well. And so, yeah, it's quite a boring story of this. So they got it, they got it commissioned and then I came on board after. I did meet Zara actually before and had like a good chat with her and we got on well. Um, but yeah, then I came. And came tell, tell us about, so Summer Films is a, a company that you've had a relationship for and, and with for a, a while right so that that relationship yeah. between the company and, and the executive producers in in, in there is, is, is was quite key to you right yeah well i feel really lucky because you know i met them four years ago and so i'm still freelance i still go off and do other things but over those four years i've worked with them five on five different projects and through four edits because I did, I did three half hours before um, the Zara film. So, and you know, when you're in the edit, you really know who someone is, but it's like week seven. And it's like someone's seen you dirty laundry, basically. So, they, so we knew each other really well, but I feel really glad that I've been able to have this relationship because it does mean that like, you, if you work for another indie and then you get to the end and they've noticed what your weaknesses are and everyone has weaknesses, and then you might, never see each other again and don't hire each other again at least if you work again you can get better build the relationship better and just have an openness between you um rather than trying to hide you know or um several ties when the production ends if it didn't go that well so so, so yeah, it's, it's like a, so it feels, it feels like yeah. if you're like, you, you're making it, if you've got a first film or an idea it's good to sort of try and team up with a company that you already have a might have a relationship or or enjoyed working there at the past so they sort of know for you. sure for, sh for sure and like this with like let's say with my execs now sam and lucy i feel like i'm in a position where where i haven't felt in the past you know you might have an exec who really wants you to push your contributor a bit harder and is wondering why you've not got that that scene that we're building up to and there's been times in the past where i've felt that and i have pushed and it's been against my instincts and it's been the wrong thing to do. And I feel in a position now where I've got execs where I can say, no, you've got to leave it with me. I've got a good relationship. I've met them, you haven't. I know Zara better than you do, for example, and feel feel respected and know that, they, and, and have them feel confident that I, I know what I'm doing um, mm -hmm. and not feel caught between them trying to please a commissioner and wanting mm -hmm. to push, you know, push harder on the ground. Brilliant. And, and Zia, you made your yeah. first film through Mino, who you'd done Valley Cops with, right? So again, you had a, a, a sort of pre-existing relationship with, with that company. Yeah, that's right. So I, I, um, I started off doing SAS there as a casting AP, actually. And I've been at Mino a lot on and off over the years, doing developments and working on different series. So I have a, I've had really good relationships there with the development team and with uh, Sophie, who's the creative director, and kind of everyone there. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a real family production company, so it was a really good place to do my uh, first film. Okay, brilliant. So, so you've got your film, um, it's been commissioned, you've bonded with your exec, and now you've got to go out and shoot the thing. Um, what's running through your mind uh, on that first shoot, and what tips can you share? Uh, with the audience about how you um, how you made it through and Neve, I know that you come from a drama background so I'd just be interested to know how that played into how you sort of prepped and, and managed your shoots. Yeah I think having the drama background really helped because I had spent a lot of time plotting stories and writing treatments for real life stories that would be made into drama and so and because the story was a retrospective story it had all played out already so it was basically retelling it um one of the key things i think that really helped was just developing a shooting script beforehand so actually really plotting out the narrative and thinking about you know how the narrative would play out and who my key characters were and how what kind of role the characters would play in the story um and so i did a lot of research beforehand before i shot anything i met everyone and i spent quite a bit of time with them just to figure them out and figure out where they sat within the story and alex's mother for example i you know, from talking to her, I found out that Alex had been a twin and he was born um, 
premature and he was much smaller than his other twin and I thought that's really interesting because you had and he you know he had to go through these operations and you know they had a brain they had to have brain surgery and I thought this is a little kid that was nearly ripped from her when he was a baby and then the psychology of that and then him being taken away from her again when um he was a teenager I, I thought I want to dig into that with Alex's mom and you know think about not only Alex's story but the story of a mother who was losing her boy um and you know and having kind of that process of developing a script and thinking about that I think helped you know kind of just shape the story really and and Ziad your um I mean your film was also retrospective and I suppose it, it, before that you'd been you'd worked on quite a lot of observational sort of films hadn't you as a an AP, I suppose. How did that? How did that sort of? How did you find that shift from uh, sort of observational through to a more retrospective story? And what were your priorities when you were sort of heading into the shoots? Um, I actually found it quite intimidating at first because, as you said, I've kind of done lots of ob stock in the past, and and I enjoy that kind of dynamic of being able to show up and and kind of make things happen. Um, but it was exciting because the story is it's a cracker it's a really intriguing kind of fun and dark story um which uh which i which i which i loved so um i for me the first place was thinking about which other films you know did i admire which felt similar and don't you know don't f with cats on netflix for me is like a gold standard version of that kind of um thriller type of online world uh, investigative type of doc and so you know I was really lucky I sort of found Mark Lewis who directed it and emailed him and said hey I'm making this film it's my first time doing this would you mind having a chat with me and he was really gracious and spent an hour talking about his process and it, for me it was like a massive kind of help because it really informed how I worked and I think it's a question of saying, you know, we've got limited archive. What's the best pieces of archive that are going to make people kind of scratch their head or be really surprised or shocked or appalled, you know, and building the film around what we had. Um, so, yeah, it, I think uh, much like Neve, it was really a process of kind of scripting and really, really preparing and, and kind of understanding who our contributors were and which parts of the story they could voice with kind of authority or levity or whatever it was. Um, and it, yeah, it was a very different process of working, but actually really enjoyable and kind of being able to plot twists and turns. It's, it's quite satisfying when it works. Um, yeah. If, if you could go back and do one thing again in terms of those shoots, is there anything that you would do differently the second time around? I, so I think maybe, I think focus of story is a big thing. I, um, I wanted to tell so much story. There's so much interesting stuff. Each of our contributors um, had their own little backstory that was really interesting. And you could go off a tangent with them talking about their own kind of maybe, you know, eating disorder or, or um, obsession with social media or whatever it was, cancer story, really interesting and, and uh, textured contributors. And so I did interviews around all these kind of tangential stories um, but they didn't make it in the edit because as soon as you kind of strayed away from Belle Gibson's story, you kind of felt like, okay, this is a different film. So I overshot, I think, and maybe, um, and that's probably something I'd, I'd have kind of given my interview time in a more focused way to really heightening the Belle Gibson story. Mm -hmm. um, Marion, when you were in your film, it was much more sort of observational in its um, in, in its sort of execution. How did how did you prepare for those shoots? I mean, from from a viewer's perspective, it felt like at times it was quite a sort of chaotic world that you were yeah. that you were sort of inhabiting. Yeah, it was very chaotic, um, and also it's sort of. I mean, we you know tried to plan as much as we could, but plans always change, you know, contributors aren't always picking up the phone, but then you look on Instagram and they're on Instagram live, and you're like, I gotta pick up the phone guys. Um, so um, we tried to plan as much, but really I think trust was the key because we relied a lot on mobile phone footage because that's what he does. He films himself all the time, he gets filmed. Sorry, that's my, um, my dog. Um, 
and so yeah so he, he really mobile phone footage became a big sort of style to the film um, and just him trusting me enough to be able to just sort of send me stuff especially you know towards the end when he was being arrested I mean f- filming all of that that in itself is sort of a big chunk of the film so um so yeah just knowing that he could sort of trust you know just film stuff and, and send it to me when I when I wasn't there um but yeah things did change and you know I didn't know what the ending for the film was going to be so um it's sort of you know towards the end really sort of thinking about was you know him going on stage for the first time is that the end of the film is it him leaving Norwich and so I was tra- trying to film scenes when I met up with him as if it was the last time it was as if this was sort of the ending because we didn't know you know it could keep the you could film these observational documentaries for years if, if you wanted to um so I didn't know what the ending was and it was sort of yeah just sort of you know it's what happened you know him, him getting arrested and and you know filming it as well which was helpful and if you could do again if you went back and, and sort of did it again would you approach the shoots in in, in a, any differently or, or can you not do you just have to sort of be there and and jump on it when you can and and, and just sort of roll I mean the way that you sort of in, so I suppose that idea that when you weren't there embracing that idea of sort of social media and using that as a way to tell the stories was very sort of in keeping with what was happening in his world right so it would you do anything differently the next time um I think I perhaps would have, I mean, it was tricky sometimes always sort of keeping up with them, but I think I would have maybe have liked to have spent, I think that the interviews were great, but I think I would have maybe have tried to push for more actuality. There was a lot of actuality, but maybe a bit more and be in the room with them a bit more, you know, as much as possible, I think. Um, yeah. Just more, more, more time with them. So um, we're going to take a, a, a pause to um, check on any questions. We've got a very sophisticated system where Beach is going to WhatsApp me the most relevant questions. Um, okay, one question. Anyone can answer it. How did you decide to structure your film and how did that change during filming and editing? Um, Tash, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, we had we had a lot of component parts in uh, our film, and um, I think at some point every scene was in every order. Uh, we really did kind of uh, move them around, and I think similar to what um, someone else has already said that you know, what Ziad was saying about like, we had lots of kind of tangential storylines that just ended up being cut away because again, as soon as you moved away from Leanne's story. Um, it stopped uh, feeling like it had kind of a red line going through it. But um, uh, the we, we decided to um, structure it uh, in a way because we, we, we wanted to make it clear that, you know, this was something that was going on in Leanne's life before um, the summer's uh, Black Lives Matter movement began. Um, and so, you know, we, we did a bit of switching things, things around and it started off. At first we had... Uh, you know the the protest at the beginning then that kind of moved a bit later but i think it was just a bit of a trial and error um uh you know yeah it's, it's a lot of trial about trial and error and getting lots of input from um commissioners and execs and and just seeing what felt right and so 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 the so your production started before the sort of black lives matter movement of last summer um and then did that shift just out of interest? Did that sort of shift Leanne? Did it have a, an effect on Leanne mid-production and, and her thinking? And and, um, and and how did you sort of deal with that at the time? Totally. I think so. The film that we pitched is nothing like the final film that we actually made because um, what was happening in the real world uh, was you know, like it was, it was all, you know, a feedback loop for what was going on in, in Leanne's personal life. And so, you know, we we just were able to lean into that and to, um, you know, really have her react to what was going on in the world. And it, and it, and it, it pushed her, it pushed her, it pushed her journey on, it pushed her on emotionally. And um, it made, it made what, um, she was dealing with like, like it meant that we didn't kind of have to like the hand of the producer wasn't uh quite as um obvious i think because what was happening in the uh 
uh, in the world and the things that she could act actively go and take part in um, were was was quite clear that we were all experiencing um, similar things around that time. So she so it just felt that she could she could react to things that were really going on rather than us having to kind of set up lots of uh, lots of different scenes for her. Yeah, it definitely felt live and un- unfolding as you were watching. Um, Angela, in- another question. As a first time director, what is the most important type of support you got and at what stage in the process? Uh, I think when you get, I think in the edit, I think having supportive execs is vital. And I've, I've definitely felt felt like that. There's just a moment where you've, you've got your scenes and you and don't get me wrong, you've got your plan but then it's just how are these like how how do i get from this bit to that bit and it, and you just and you you need those notes in the edit i think i think that's it don't on, on like i like to be a bit pushed as well i like to i like the support from the exec to really um um not be fearful of telling me what i might be missing so i, I ought to, to answer the question all the way through it but i think that there's that but maybe like week three of the edit, you've started structuring it and you just need, you need the support to come in and to just um, not make, yeah, be supportive, not making you feel like what's going on. <laughs> Does anyone sense, else want yeah. to talk to that, answer that yeah. question in terms of, you know, was there a moment where you were, you needed some support and it came in just at the, at the right moment? Um, I mean, Go on, Neve. Go on, Neve. Sorry, mine is really quick. It was just um, just before I was due to interview Alex, and um, I had an absolute panic because it was just about how I was going to interview him and what background, because everybody was in kind of a domestic background, and that was what I wanted. But I was really struggling with the aesthetic for Alex's because I was um, I was thinking, well, he 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 was staying with his parents, and I was like, he doesn't have a place visually. He doesn't. He doesn't have a place and how do I do that and how do I manage that and I just remember Brian Hill was very supportive um, and I had kind of a good friendship with him I suppose before the film so he was great for advice but I just remember the day before filming running to Brian and been like I want to change everything for the interview I think I need to do a black background ah oh, what'll I do and he was just really calm and he was like you know it was like that's fine you know, it's okay to change things last minute. He goes, I think that's a good idea. And he talked through the idea with me and talked through the aesthetic with me. And just, um, yeah, it felt like really chaotic that I was changing things last minute, but I'm really glad I did. And, you know, I probably should have thought of it weeks ago and I could have planned it a bit better. But um, yeah, it was it was just good to have that support, especially from a filmmaker who, you know, was really experienced to just say, that's okay, that's a good idea, you know, go with it. and you know, you just go into a bit feeling a bit more confident. And Marion, you were going to say something. I mean, oh. I was just going to say, I mean, my exec, Emma, Emma Wakefield at Lambin, and also Bijal, uh, actually, at Patel, um, we, I mean, with the CBO, it's sort of a, a, a sort of a legal minefield, and, you know, we're on the ground forming, and sometimes there are interactions with the police or things that happen, and, and you know, I sort of wanted to focus, you need to focus on get, you know, filming and not worrying about, right, what are the, what's legally, what, what's going on here? I'm really kind of worried about, um, you know, so having someone like Emma and and Bijar so to be able to ring and sort of deal with things in the office while we were on the ground really, really helped. Um, yeah. So that's, that's really good. Thank you. Um, I think, like, uh, Neve, you mentioned um, interviews, getting that sort of killer sync for your film is is critical, right? It's all about story. And without that critical sync, you haven't got anything. And I was thinking, Tash, so when you're interviewing someone like Leanne, I'm assuming that in the past she's been interviewed in, in that sort of world of popping, perhaps in a more superficial way. Um, and you would have had to take her to a deeper level in terms of the types of interviews that you were doing. Um, you have a huge advantage as a friend, but we've also sort of discussed that that also comes with its sort of issues. How did you decide where to draw the boundaries of your interview and what was off limits? What, you know, what was bleeding into your friendship and, and what was, you know, what was sort of germane to the documentary? I mean, I think we, I was very, very lucky in the fact that there wasn't that much that was actually off limits with Leanne. I mean, she had total trust in the process. 
Um, but it did take her a little while to get used to the style of interviewing, as she kind of alluded to. It's like, you know, she's used to a very different uh, type of interview. And uh, I think a lot of it came down to I think what we've spoken about a lot already, but it's like the openness that, you know, she wanted the film to be good. She asked asked me very directly, you know, like, what do I have to do to make this film good? And we could just, I could just be very honest with her, like, you know, the more vulnerability, the more openness and the more access you can give me, um, the better this will make the film. And in terms of getting to that, like, real stuff, um, with Leanne, it was about being there physically over the summer to be able to track her emotional journey as things unfolded and as she kind of could react to the ongoing narrative that was happening in the wider world. And last summer was such a pivotal time for her. So it was, you know, we did end up shooting a master interview, which kind of wasn't originally my plan. So I'd kind of I'd be interviewed as we we're going along, but then that did mean that I had, you know, I knew what sync I wanted to recreate in the master interview. And uh, like as as an interviewer, I think often it's about like revisiting those subjects over time, whether that's like over the hour you're interviewing somebody or over a couple of months, and, like peeling back the layers of an onion um, uh, to get to what what she you know really felt about certain things, and and also I think we have a responsibility as directors not to kind of. And it sounds weird, but like not to let our contributors off the hook. If you if you feel there is something underneath that they're not quite getting to, um, being slightly um, persistent. And I wanted to make something with this film that was genuinely challenging to the audience. And so sometimes that meant kind of challenging to Leanne. And you know, I always think if if you're if some asking some of those questions doesn't make you feel a little bit funny then you probably haven't asked the right question but it's about preparing your contributor not for the questions that you're going to ask them but that there are going to be difficult questions and like I had a long chat with Leanne about the fact that you know we can control the narrative of this film for the one hour that it is on the television and anything that we mm -hmm. you know shy away from or um Kind of omit Twitter will answer for us so mm -hmm. I was like I have to ask you all of the questions that people might be sat on their sofas at home and asking and by preparing her that there's going to be those hard questions it meant that when they came along and um, she you know she knew that it wasn't you know that it wasn't a personal attack on her that it was actually you know the difficult questions were giving her a real opportunity that um she you know would want us to include those things in the film and um, and and Neve, I suppose in terms of exposure to the media, um, if Leanne is at one end of the spectrum, Alex is probably at the other, right? So, what strategies did you use to make him feel comfortable and and tell his story? Well, I had to think quite a bit about his interview and when I interview him, because often when you're making a documentary, you feel like the instinct is to interview them quite early on in the process because you get something fresh, and you know they haven't told it a million times and you know you get something quite raw but with Alex my gut was saying to me to wait because and to do him last and and it was just from spending time with him in the very early stages before I picked up the camera and trying to get a read of him and I realized quite quickly that there was two things that were real blockers for him one was well, three things actually. Was, yeah, one was that he had told his story quite a bit before, and I really wanted to break that down because I didn't want him to just give out the rote story that he had told to news and things, and also and build a trust with him. But also, when when he was in a relationship with Jordan, she would always um, tell him to shut up and tell him not to speak. So he couldn't in the beginning. He couldn't make eye contact with me, and he always looked to the ground and kind of spoke into himself. And and I knew he needed to develop confidence and to develop trust and almost, you know, to to develop his own confidence in himself before we sat down and did that interview. And one thing he really struggled with was um, talking about having any feelings of love towards Jordan. He actually was able to access all the violence and talk about that quite openly, quite early, but he couldn't really go there when I'd ask him about when the relationship was good. And I think by talking to him all the way through and just 
being really honest with him about how you know his story we what we needed to portray his story and you know why it was important to talk about those things i think it just helped him open up a lot more and you know doing the interview at the very end i think was a good call because he he was just a lot more confident even his body language was different and he was able to talk about all that stuff mm -hmm. brilliant that's really useful thank you um so you've made it, you've all made it through the shoot. You've got the rushes. You've managed, somehow you've managed to hustle together a bunch of rushes that you then pass on to the editor. Um, how was that for you? And it'd be interesting to try and, it'd be interesting for the audience to learn from your experience. Ziad, you know, uh, as we said before, the benefit of a retrospective story is you know um, how it ends before you start shooting. But what, you know, what was that edit experience like for you it was a really it was a really positive experience actually the edit and actually i watched a session that you did jez about hometown and some you guys had mentioned involving the editor early on and martin thompson who's our incredible editor he was really open to that and so we were kind of talking about the story he'd seen the archive and and we're talking about it even before the project started so by the time we got to the edit it was quite focused what we shot in that uh, we had a script, we had a story outline, and we kind of, we kind of quite methodically gone about doing that. Th having said that, because of COVID, things just kept getting shifted and shunted back. So I was shooting a lot in the edit as well, which is a kind of mixed, it's a double-edged sword because you, when you're shooting from the edit, you can understand the little gaps in story or understand maybe what didn't quite go right in that first master interview and address that. Um, and I tried also because you know Martin's really experienced. Our exec from the from the office said, you know, if you if we can get Martin to do it, he's an incredible editor. You watch his work, so I had a real trust in his kind of editorial um, nous and his his kind of experience really. So it's a real a, a wonderful kind of formative learning experience for me as well. Kind of talking to him about story and how to kind of make things work. And, you know, we'd have disagreements as well and quite spirited <laughs> discussions about what we thought was the better option. But um, it was a really positive experience. And, and I think the other thing for me was I was really conscious that he's, he's cut, you know, uh, the rushes of lots of directors who I really admire. So I'd ask him, you know, like, what did you think of that master interview? Like, what would you have changed? What would you do better? And certainly, I, like I said, because we were shooting throughout the, the edit, I, I felt myself become more confident, um, certainly with, with, with master interviews and kind of clearer and more concise and more focused. And so, yeah, I mean, it was a very, a very positive experience and, and sort of I've done other edits as well. And this I'd say was the most smooth sailing. And what did you, what would you say is the number one thing that you learned from him? I mean, it sounds like he was great at giving you constructive feedback. What, what did you think? What was the sort of, if there was a, a tip that he I gave mean, I think you? It, I think it, I said probably something I've mentioned already, but it's really about focus. I'm kind of like, I'm greedy. I just wanted to talk about everything. It's like, this story has this theme and that theme and this theme and there's this happening and that's happening. It's a massive world. We want to build it all. And like, you know, wanting to get everything in and crowbar it in and, and talk about everything that I'm interested in about this story. But actually it became much more powerful the more we refined it and the more we kind of trimmed the fat and kind of focused it. So that, for me, you know, with a 45-minute kind of BBC Three film, it felt like we've got a mission, we've got a really amazing story, let's just stick to it. And, and that's kind of, for me, the takeaway, I think, about just trying to be focused um, in, in the approach to storytelling. And um, Angela, how important was the, the relationship with your editor? Yeah, I had a positive experience too. I actually had, to, we had to pause actually due to COVID as well. So I ended up with two editors. Um, my series just turned on, I'm just going to turn it off. But, <laughs> um, and yeah, it's, it's just, it's just having to just work as a team and just get on together. And also knowing that trust you editor, they, they know what they're doing, but also neither of you always know all the answers. And I remember we got to maybe week six and watched it back and the music was just so depressing and wrong. And we had to just go through and strip out. We were like, what were we thinking? It was just, 
I don't like we'd, we'd made like mistakes with our music choices and we had to go back but you know that was both of us together and then both of us realizing yeah that we need to change that this needs to be more uplifting it seemed appropriate but it wasn't so yeah working as a team and in this film um because it was authored by Zara um we really looked at using voiceover as a storytelling tool where um you know there could be scenes I've shot for example shot a scene of her that was quite a boring business meeting to do with a new hair care product that she had coming out and I know when I'm filming it that this is never going to be a sequence about Zara's new hair care product but I know that this when I'm filming it that this probably could help me with the voiceover and if I maybe shoot it in slow motion or make sure I get lots of shots of people looking at her avoid people talking because I know it's not going to be about what they're talking about and then it and then we did end up using it under a sequence of her voiceover saying whenever I go into a room and meet someone new I wonder how they see my images and it worked really well and I think that was really interesting to do in this edit that I haven't been able to do before which is planning planning getting the shots that you need for the voiceover and having that as a as as a as another little storytelling tool that you've got up your sleeve and I'm doing another film with Zara now and I'm doing the same thing I'm collecting all the shots that will help me you know Zara might meet a victim but then she goes home and reflects on it and I need those shots of her or she might be on the treadmill in the gym and she's thinking it goes under the voiceover and they all get mopped up everything that you've on these authored films it all gets used um and I think I think that was something that was really like it was quite exciting sometimes to realize that it worked you're like yes <laughs> brilliant and and um and yeah. marion i think you involved your editor quite early on right sam santana and you uh, how, how early did he get involved and and was that beneficial i before the film even got commissioned i wanted to talk to my um, exec about getting an editor <laughs> she was like it hasn't even been commissioned yet so it was really important to get an editor like from the beginning um but i mean he uh, got we you know, got him got sam santana on board he's brilliant um he was still on his previous job so he was still in an edit with another film but we you know i made sure that you know i'd maybe film something you know and i'd ring him and just sort of tell him about how it went and what i was going to film next and really sort of telling him about the characters and the world and i know i'd fall in love with everyone in that world and i wanted him to to do the same he, he was you know he hadn't watched the russia yet but he was really engaged and you know, he's got amazing, you know, he's edited amazing films. So to be able to, and, and for a long time, so for, for him to say, okay, you've, you've filmed this this way, but when you go back to him, maybe think about going in, you know, filming it like this. So he was giving me, although he's an editor, he was giving me filming advice. So it was really good to have that dialogue. Um, and then sort of a week before the edit started, um, uh, you know, we have to sort of log everything and off, sometimes people do paper logs or they do a digital log um, and Sam came around we we're editing in my house and Sam came around and he set me up with an Avid which is the editing software and he basically showed me how to sort of put things on a timeline and log on the timeline and it saved us an entire week in the edit because it meant that he could just watch you know the log on Avid and sort of see what I'd filmed without watching everything um, so it saved us time so he taught me a lot I mean he taught me how to use Avid which is uh, you know quite incredible um, so yeah, him, you know, getting for me, getting him involved early, communicating with him, him being involved in the conversations, falling in love with the characters, I thought was, because then he just brought the most amazing energy and, and yeah, it was, I had a wonderful time. I mean, I, I think that's a really important point. I think sometimes you feel like some editors are sort of unobtainable in a way, don't you? But actually, they're, I think they're often looking to do something which is, you know, uh, maybe, um, you know, a, a, a small sort of first time film, which is on a, on a single subject. Often they're involved in big machines and actually they want a sort of opportunity to get a break out of that. And I think they're more, you know, they re really are willing to talk to sort of first time filmmakers and, and, and yeah, their, their advice is kind of invaluable, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think don't, yeah, just don't be afraid of contacting the best editors in the industry. And because I, that's how I saw Sam, you know, Sam in my eyes is one of the, one of the best. And so, yeah, ring, ring them and you'd be surprised. I think passion, you know, you know, passion and, and hunger and amazing characters. I think that's for any editor that's attractive. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a massive series or if it's a first film. So I'd say go for it, you know, watch films, see who's edited them and approach them. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so we're running, we've got, we're, we're down to our last sort of um, five minutes. Um, and uh, just a quick question. I mean, it's great, it's great to see on this panel that women outnumber 
the blokes five to one uh, this year. I'm not too sure that would have been the case two or three years ago. Um, how hard has it been to make that leap from producer to producer director? Um, Tash, do you want to speak to that? Um, because you know, if it, 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 has something changed or is it? What, how is it for you? Sure. I mean, I think I mean, for a long time, I didn't think that I would direct. Uh, I didn't study film. I didn't know anything about cameras before I started working in TV. And uh, I think like a lot of women in this industry had a few kind of negative experiences with, in my case, like male PDs and uh, just heard little things along the way, just thought like, well, this isn't for me. But I was always attracted to the idea of directing. And uh, I did the Wanted to Watch scheme in 2018. And for that, you get um, paired with a mentor and I was fortunate enough to get Claire Sillery as my mentor and um, she kind of pointed me in the direction of the uh, BBC and Channel 4 setting up this uh, uh, female producers to directors course where they went and sent um, sent the 10 of us on a two-week course at the NFTS and it was incredible it was amazing it just like really made me realize I could do it kind of learning a lot of this stuff with like in a room full of women uh, was a very uh, formative and also also actually made me realise that, you know, there's loads of stuff that I was learning for the first time, but there was also lots of stuff I was like, oh, actually, I did know that and I knew that already and I knew that bit. And often when I was more junior, I'd get kind of quite bamboozled by, uh, you know, boys using lots of uh, numbers and letters to describe parts of the camera and just thought like, oh, this is a bit much. But um then I realised that I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so basically I'm being told that I'm running over. It's so uh, basically don't get intimidated. No, no, my fault. I, yeah. I tell, I've never done this before. I told you I'm running. No, but don't get intimidated by the kit. Don't get intimidated by the lenses. Just go for it. You've got an idea and 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 and, and try and produce. So I'm gonna um, quick uh, final uh, roundup. Uh, so tips. Uh, you've all got a tip for me uh, uh, in terms of, not for me, for the audience, for making their first okay. film. Can we um, can we run through those and it, very briefly? Um, Tash, what's your tip? Uh, my tip would be don't get too attached to anything in the edit. Notes will come in, things will change, things will improve. Sometimes you have to totally dismantle the film and put it back together again, but it will ultimately make it better. Great. Thank you, Ziad. Uh, I think you have to be kind to yourself because things are going to go wrong and contributors are going to fall away and access is going to wobble. But And you make mistakes because it's your first one. But don't beat yourself up because the audience can't see what's not there. They're just going to see a good film at the end of it. Brilliant. Uh, Neve? Uh, I think it's just trust your gut because when you start directing it's really terrifying I remember the first time I stepped out and realized everyone was looking at me and waiting on me to make the decisions and it was like oh boy and I think it's just to remember what excited you about the subject and about the people and the idea and just always keep that as the core and keep coming back to that when you're being pulled in 200 different directions brilliant and um, Angela um, even though you'll be really busy at the start of the shoot and not have much time, start planning for the edit straight away and structuring the film really, really early. And then when you get to the edit, trust the editor. They know what they're doing. And finally, uh, Marion. I think um, my advice would be, for me, for a long time, I wanted to direct films that were my ideas, my, people that I'd found, and actually sometimes a commissioner or an exec might come to you with an idea and you think this isn't my dream idea this isn't what i had in mind for my first one just accept a direct just make something and, and make it your own would be my advice and also watch lots of films i think for me one of obviously working on films but just watch films fall in love with films have references the directors whose work you like so how can you emulate that how can you um, you know make it your own so yeah that'd be me Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think we've got time for maybe. Uh, OK, I think we've covered the, I think we've covered the questions. So I think that's it. I hope this has been useful for everyone that's been watching. Big thanks to the panel. I've really enjoyed uh, uh, the last hour. It's been brilliant. And thanks to B. Jill Patel, the producer of the session. Um, but also she's just in terms of um, in terms of the new director's initiative, I know she's absolutely sort of instrumental in in driving that and, and helping you guys make your first film. 
Um, just also want to say thanks for DocFest for having us and for everyone else um, and, and, and for people who've been watching. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you very much.